Hello everyone and welcome to Planet Outlook. In this episode, we explore the world of birds and the special bonding we share with them. Birds have always fascinated us, be it in aviation, be it in fashion, be it in our arts and culture, birds are everywhere in our lives. To talk about this more, we have a special guest joining us from the UK. Is an eminent author, naturalist, and broadcaster. Please welcome Mark Cocker. Amongst his many award-winning books, the one which stands out, at least to me, is Birds and People, which Mark took several years to complete, collaborating with over 600 people in 80 countries, bringing to us fascinating insights on bird life and the amazing relationship we share with them. Mark, in this lockdown, we saw a lot of people connecting back to nature through birds. How do you react to that? Um, well, the, the book was um, an attempt to chart something which I think we often overlook, which is um, the world of environmentalism values nature often for clean water or because uh, uh, forest is an important source of medicine or whatever. We see it in, in, in very practical and, and material terms. And one of the themes that I've been working on for the last 20 years is that nature is central to our cultural lives. In other words, nature lives out there in the fields and in the forests and, and is... Uh, Yes, is, 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 is part of the life of the planet, but nature also lives between our ears, in our heads, and it enriches our minds and our cultural lives. And in a curious way, lockdown has, has brought this to the fore because for the first time people are, uh, because the sounds of humans have declined, the sounds of nature have come to the um, and, and animals have got bold and so you live in a country where you have a deep uh, respect and and kind attitude towards nature so birds are often very tame anyway parrots and miners and house crows and things coming onto your balconies swifts and swallows nesting around your houses etc uh, tailor birds in the garden or indian robins things like that so um People have really, really seen nature very closely and, and it provides them with comfort. They love the idea that in this time of trauma and problems, nature shows that life is actually continuing. The world continues to work as it should do. While we're obsessed with COVID, etc., the world of nature brings us comfort. So one of the classic characteristics of nature and of birds in particular through their wonderful sounds through the bird song etc they uh, bring us mental peace they bring us um, they soothe us they relax us they give us interest and so so lockdown has telescoped and brought to the fore how nature functions with for us but the book birds and people was an attempt to capture in a single snapshot, if you can call a three kilo book weighing, you know, weighing a huge amount with 400 pictures and 400,000 words, um, a snapshot it took me five years to write it. And um, yes, it attempts to show how the full world of birds has an extraordinary impact on our cultural lives and for me this meeting in this strange virtual space is very exciting because this man Ananda Banerjee was probably the biggest contributor to the book of all the people on the planet I sent out messages via articles and magazines to get contributors to send me material and I didn't know Ananda until the book started and somehow he heard about it and became a, a central contributor, sending me hundreds of contributions on all sorts of things. So Ananda, it's a privilege to, to see you in person for the first time. And I've longed to come to India so that we could, you know, go for a meal or something. But anyway, it's lovely to be here. And 
And that was one of the central points of the book, that it wasn't just my voice in the book. It was as many piece of people as possible. And in the end, we got 600 people from 81 countries. And so all this choral, uh, this, this choral symphony of voices from around the world tell the story partly of how birds play a part in our lives. And of course, Indians are writ large, uh, birds are writ large in the culture of Indians. Um, one thinks particularly, say, of uh, the peacock, which has, which Ananda contributed to, has a central place in your heart, I think, as your national bird, has a place as a chariot for your gods and goddesses, is a bird that um, people name their daughters after and is a source of good luck and, 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 and usually uh, is an auspicious bird for people, is, an, is, a, is, a, is a, a resident of your forests and, and of your farmland environments, much loved by people. So that was the kind of thing which we wanted to, to cover. What about the similar stories that you have recorded from other nations? Well, I mean, it's a mixed picture. Um, and very often what was interesting to see was how different cultures approached the same uh, bird, but in very different ways. So that was one of the, the most interesting, the contrast between how one culture could celebrate a bird um, and, and then in another country it was reviled or hated. Just to give you one or two examples. Um, when I was growing up, when I was a young child, just down the road from where I'm sitting now, um, my grandma was very, very um, uh, upset because I'd found or been given these enormous peacock tail feathers. And in Britain, for certain people of, of my grandma's generation, peacocks were seen as bad luck. And to take the feathers into your house was the worst luck of all. So my grandma was expecting um, a real tragedy for me if I kept these peacock feathers. So, I mean, of course, in India, peacocks are birds auspicious and birds of good fortune. But for some reason, the British, I don't know why, but that's the nature of folklore. It's often very irrational. Just to give you two more examples. Uh, Corvids, one of the nice stories, one of the most wonderful stories was that um, Indian people would provide crows on the roof on the celebration of the death of a relative, putting out white rice on their roof as a sort of offering to the household gods and to their ancestors and to their relatives, their beloved relatives who died. And Corvids, um, I mean, again, you know, the Corvids had very negative associations often um, for Europeans. Just to give you one small example, in the 17th century, a jackdaw, which is a bit like your house crow, a small Corvid with a grey head, uh, flew into the Houses of Parliament in London and the whole session was cancelled. <laughs> because because they saw it as a as a bad omen. So um, often, for instance, black as, uh, blackbirds are associated with evil and negative things, and um, and yet in India the birds are celebrated. Just to give you one more of examples of these contrasts, um, we have a bird in our country called the common starling or the European starling. It's a close relative of your common miner. So anybody listening today, looking out the window, would hear that very characteristic sound of the Indian city and townscape, this bird with white flashes on its wing and a black head and a sort of uh, lovely sort of chestnut brown uh, belly. I may have got the details a little bit wrong sometimes since I've seen one, but you know, Miners are very much loved and tolerated in India and fed and people would never dream, I don't think, of persecuting them. And yet in America, where uh, the common starling that was the European bird was imported by a, nut, a, a nutcase, it was a great Shakespeare fan. And this 19th century uh, dramatist and, and actor 
wanted to introduce into the American landscape all the birds that were mentioned in Shakespeare. So he struggled hard to introduce the starling. And the starling, um, a bit like um, American immigrants from Italy or from Poland or Germany, they did rather well in America. And, and now there are half a billion starlings across the whole of America. And they hate them. They're always trying to, to kill them, et cetera. So, so it's quite interesting to see how birds um, a, a acquire different cultural roles. And the interesting thing, one of the most um, telling things which should be a source of pride for your audience in India is that Indian people were amazingly willing to get involved in this project. That was one of the most moving things for me. People like you, Ananda, would contribute to this, this book source. And the other thing is, by and large, the very positive attitudes that Indians have towards wildlife. And that is a very heartening uh, response. It's writ large in your culture. You're incredibly close to nature. Of course, you have 1.2 billion people, I think. You have enormous pressures on your resources, on your forest, on your water, on your, on your entire landscape to feed this number of people. And yet alongside those human pressures, which India uh, the human India exerts on its landscape, you're also remarkably close to nature. And that was one of the fascinating things for me. Of course, I've, I've traveled at length in India, especially in the north, in Rajasthan and Delhi and um, up into Kashmir and Ladakh and, and in Nepal as well. So I had a sense of this and knew about it. Um, and that was a fascinating, and that's uh, the DNA of Indian relationships with nature are, are woven into the text of the book. What about birds of prey, especially eagles and falcons, Mark, that has dominated the cultural landscape of many nations? In fact, the cover of Birds and People has this fabulous picture from Mongolia of the eagle hunters. Tell us a bit more on this. Yes, birds of prey are, um, you know, like shikra and once your incredibly abundant vultures and eagles. If you go, if, if some of the, uh, your watchers um, know places like Bharatpur and um, across northern India, eagles are very widespread and um, birds of prey have largely been uh, appropriated by political leaders. So the eagle has always been represented as a as a regal bird as a bird of, of of kings and this is a very ancient story so uh from the time of um the assyrians and um the ancient people of mesopotamia and the middle east eagles and birds of prey were associated with political power and, um, and, and birds of prey are probably on more flags of countries around the world than any other bird. You think of Mexico, the most obvious is the symbol of the American eagle, the bald eagle, and, um, and, and, and other countries as well. Um, but alongside this appropriation of the symbol of the eagle, um, People have actually not really liked eagles too much because they do something we do, we want. They eat ducks and they eat game birds and, and we like to eat game birds and ducks and so they're competitors for us. So alongside that, people have often persecuted birds of prey and particularly in America in the 20th century, bald eagles were very badly treated, often persecuted and shot as were golden eagles. But um, certain cultures and especially in Asia, and you mention the extraordinary story of taming eagles that occurs in Kazakhstan and Mongolia, largely among ethnic Mongolians. And they spend an enormous amount of time, first of all, capturing the birds, not an easy bird to get close to. Uh, they probably take them from nests and train them. And, um, and the bird is, is a heavy bird. You know, if you see an eagle, it's, it's big. And it weighs a lot, um, up to 10 kilos or eight kilos. And they have them on their arms and they fly them 
to training them to catch things. Um, it's a kind of cultural legacy now. It's not really the uh, subsistence hunting that would once have been done to feed the family. But at one time, it was a, a genuinely practical activity. And um, But now it's kind of part of the ritual life of Mongolia. And they have festivals to celebrate this eagle hunting. And the birds have to perform certain challenges. And the, the one that does best wins a medal, etc. But they still hunt with them. They catch foxes. It is even said that eagles will fly to um, capture wolves. That seems unlikely, but it's possible. I mean, they're certainly extraordinary birds, and there are amazing bits of footage of eagles trying to tackle very large goats and mountain animals. So eagles were used in hunting, and um, falconry, of course, is a major obsession of Middle Eastern principalities like Dubai, Kuwait, uh, the, um, the Middle Eastern states on the edge of Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia itself. And these falconers have become completely obsessed and often visited Pakistan, for instance, to go hunting with falcons. So birds of prey have been used as a sort of practical tool to, uh, at one time, to to gain food for the family and for the family cooking pot. But more recently, it's a kind of status symbol. It's a bit like a Maserati. Some of these falcons, particularly things like Gaia falcons and Sakers, are um, illegally imported into the Middle East and traded for unbelievable sums of money. I mean, sometimes up to $100,000. So there is, um, again, you know, birds have um, a variety of stories attaching to them, some of them wholly positive, some more negative and, and um, having very negative impacts on the uh, wild status of these birds of prey. What's the most touching personal account that you came across while writing this book? Yes, okay. Well, I was funnily enough, I, um, I have a friend who's, uh, who's a concert pianist and uh, her mother lived in Vancouver. And on the day that her mother died very recently, uh, Annie, my friend, saw a, a, hum a, a, a hummingbird. And um, this was a very moving experience for her. And I got a wonderful contribution, which I cherish and love. It brings tears to my eyes. And it tells of somebody who was very, um, had a very deprived life and a troubled life, probably with a broken family. She had a drug problem, etc. And the teller of the story, the young, the woman that, that sent me this story, as you sent me stories, Ananda, told me about this woman, and she'd seen for the first time in her life at 42 a hummingbird. Now I have to explain what a hummingbird is, um, but very similar to your. Um, uh, sunbirds that you get in the garden, these fantastically beautiful, often iridescent blue or bright yellow or red, tiny little birds that have long slender beaks that feed on nectar. The difference is that the hummingbird is probably the most extreme vertebrate life form on Earth um, with a metabolism more similar to a bumblebee. And the beat of the wing, the reason it's called a hummingbird is because the, the, the wings beat at this incredible rate, somewhere between 80 and sometimes 200 beats per second, 200 beats per second. Their hearts beat at a thousand times a minute and they are jewel-like, iridescent birds. And they've been loaded, freighted with all sorts of cultural associations for many cultures in the Americas. I should say that there are about 360 species of hummingbird and they're largely, and they're all focused in the New World, in the Americas, mainly in countries like Brazil and Ecuador. But, um, but this person seeing the first hummingbird, saying what it was like for her to see this hummingbird was a powerful expression of how 
the magic and the significance of birds can come to you at any point in your life and regardless of the circumstances and can be transformative. And one of the nice stories that we got from all sorts of people, both, I've done two projects. I did one called Birds Britannica, which was kind of a British folklore book, shorter than birds and people. But very often we got stories from people who suffered a tragic bereavement, the death of a loved one that was very close, like a daughter or a father, and a bird would appear for some unknown and inexplicable reason in their lives. Um, a friend of mine, his father died in very tragic circumstances. And, um, and on the day, on the day of his funeral, a robin, a little robin, you have a magpie robin, we have a little bird with a red breast, came and sat on, on his father's chair. Never ever experienced anything like that before. Another person contributed an owl, um, which are birds of darkness and often associated with death, came and landed and visited their house. And a story I was told was a woman whose daughter died in a car crash. And on the day that, on the, one of the days when, uh, after the funeral, uh, the mother was grieving and she heard a funny noise and she went through into the other room and lying on the floor um, outside was a little kingfisher. And everybody knows that kingfishers are amazing electric blue and bright orange. And this seeing this bird, the, I mean, I'm not arguing for some kind of, um, you know, transmutation of souls, you know, the transference of souls in some Buddhist uh, eschatology, but I... They simply saw a bird and it was a coincidence. That's not important. What's important is what it means to those people. And it brings them comfort and reconciliation. And of course, just to return to lockdown, that's exactly what we're seeing with lockdown, that people are finding birds or a source of solace, of peace of mind. They, they're, they're, they're very positive. And I think this is the, one of the key arguments of the book. That when we lose biodiversity, we don't just lose something that's out there that we have a moral responsibility for. We lose the texture and complexity of our own souls. And so birds are, yes, are much more important culturally than we've given them credit for. When we lose biodiversity, we lose something about ourselves. And, and the book tries to uh, illuminate how birds have enriched our lives in, in a multiplicity of ways. Some birds are now icons of extinction. Many species have vanished from the face of the earth and now several are on the brink of extinction. Which ones do you think will go extinct in our lifetime? Yes, I mean, what, the interesting thing is that um, for the Europeans and particularly for the British, the bird we associate with extinction is the dodo, which was one of the earliest extinctions in the 17th century. But as you rightly point out, Ananda, we are facing um, an environmental holocaust of many species of bird. And I, I don't know the exact figure because it increases all the time, but of the 10,500 birds I think at least 1,200 or 1,600 are now threatened with extinction. Probably the most um, heightened, the one that is most critical, uh, that will be possibly known to your audience is the Great Indian Bustard, which has India in the title. And, um, and similarly, the Bengal Florican, the Lesser Florican. These extraordinary birds are ground-dwelling uh, like a game bird, very long-legged. They live in um, one of the most threatened habitats in India in grassland environments and semi-desert landscapes. The Great Indian Bustard, I think now, is almost vanished from its natural range. And the extraordinary thing is, when I was a young man at 22, I saw Great Indian Bustard just near Jaisalmer, one of the most extraordinary species I've seen in my life, I should uh, I should point out that the challenges that the Indians face with the, these three 
uh, what are called busted species, the two Floricans and the Great Indian Busted, are replicated almost worldwide. So of the 25 or so species of busted on the earth, very few of them are in uh, healthy condition. Great busted, little busted, both of these are European birds that face the same kind of challenge. I think it's anything that lives on the ground is most threatened. And of course, the other uh, icons of extinction, if you like, which exemplify rainforest are parrots, very large parrots. Um, India is fortunate, or maybe unfortunate, some of your listeners will say, that um, rose-ring parakeet is an enormously abundant species in your cities. And it's the kind of thing that you take for granted, and many of you will absolutely love the sound of parakeets screeching at evening. It's embedded in your sense of dusk. But, but there are parrots that around the world are... We, we are um, both a wonderful species and a terrible species. We're so, we're so um, greedy and we want to own everything. And one of the terrible things that parrots face is simply people want to own them in, in cages. I'm not talking here about parakeets, which are invulnerable to human pressures at the moment, but many very, very beautiful macaws, a scarlet macaw, hyacinth macaw, Leah's macaw, Spix's macaw, these birds of South American rainforest have been hunted by people who both, who claim to love them, but really want to possess them. I think it's the, it's the cupidity of humans. They want to own them. And so, so parrots, um, one of the largest, in fact, the largest and most diverse family of birds on earth, I think it's something like 360 species many of them are threatened because of our desire to own them and so the cage bird trade is a is a problem and is unregulated and is often illegal and these birds exemplify um, the threats which humans pose to the environment and those two challenges as with the florican and with the parrots are about habitat loss. But there are also one third bird I should mention is that um, seabirds are some of the most extraordinary birds on the planet. And I'm thinking in particular of albatrosses, which possibly occur on the most remote um, Indian islands and on the shorelines of the very south. But it's a bird of the largely of the Southern Oceans and albatrosses such as the wandering albatross have been terribly threatened by fishing. And unfortunately, they, they dive down. The birds eat squid and uh, aquatic animals and, um, uh, and, they, and they get caught on these hooks and dragged under the water and drown. So albatross has really brought home how human harvesting measures and methods are often very problematic. Um, so these are just three kinds of birds which, um, which are in very severe uh, condition and, and they highlight the actions we need, we need to take. And I would imagine you and Enda could tell us more about the fate and the and the fortunes of the great Indian busted than probably anybody, but um, but I know that it's a, it's an iconic bird and um, it reflects the challenges which people who are conservationists and environmentalists face when it comes to the pressures that humans are putting on the planet. Any particular favorite group of birds, Mark? And what are you currently working on? Well, I, I love all birds, but I'm currently writing a book about swifts, and I particularly love swifts. I can see swifts as I speak to you out of my window, and in fact, we recently had a correspondence about the swifts that you see over Delhi, and if anybody has any observations about swifts, they could send them to me through my website. I'd love to hear of them, but um, yes, I think birds, the key thing for me is that um, all birds really, I love them all. Um, Swifts in particular because their powers of flight, which is 
in many ways the defining characteristic of all birds. I know great Indian bustards and ostriches and things like that either can't fly or don't fly very much, but flight is something which is central to our experience of birds. It's probably why they captivate, captivate us so much because they express the idea of transcendence, of us journeying to another life or transformed by emotion. So birds are often associated with romance, changes of emotional state. And, um, but I think birds capture very powerfully the wholeness of life. You can't really look at a swift without knowing that its entire life, everything about it, its migration, its, its physical form is based on the fact that it eats insects. And so birds lead us to contemplate the whole of life. If you're interested in swifts, you have to be interested in insects. If you're interested in insects, you have to be interested in vegetation. If you're interested in vegetation, you have to be interested in the, the central role that bacteria play in life. So what I'm increasingly interested in, I like big themes, as you can tell from this book, but, um, but I like the idea of trying to understand the whole of life. And so my next book is an explora exploration of the totality of life, but using a single bird as a symbol for that wholeness, which we're all part of. And uh, that's what I'm working on. <laughs> and that's what I love. I know you love crows. You devoted an entire book to them. Yes, um, I wrote a book about corvids and um, well, I like blackbirds. Um, my great love in life is birds that are black with no colour. Um, I don't know why. I, and we have a thrush in England. You have, let me try and think of, well, you have a blue whistling thrush. I'm trying to think of a common thrush yeah. in your l landscape. Well, we have this bird like a thrush and it has a beautiful song. We call, it's called the blackbird. You have two species. You have grey winged blackbird. Yeah, yeah and uh, another species in the Himalayas. And I love the sound of blackbirds. I love the sounds of all birds. Um, but blackbirds are the thing that I have a great affection for. Thank you, Mark. It was great having you on Planet Outlook. And I look forward to your new book next year. Thank you. Anyway, it's been lovely to talk to you, Ananda.